Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this uh, edition of AO North America Hand Education Committee's Hand Internet Live session. This is being brought to you by the entire AO North America Hand Education Committee. And uh, we are delighted that you could join us this evening. Today's topics are somewhat interesting because they do the deal with the distal radius. I'm going to be presenting on when is a volar locked plate a monoblock plate, not the right choice in a distal radius fracture. And Kyle Bikel and Amit Gupta are going to talk to us about 1, 2, and 4, 5 ICSRA flaps. The entire committee will be here, and these are their disclosures. All the conflicts have been resolved. For the sake of this uh, web-based learning session, all your microphones have been muted and your videos have been turned off, but we really, really would love to hear from you uh, via the question answer box at the bottom. Marco Rizzo and Tom Hunt are going to be moderating the questions today and they will pass them on to the faculty or they'll answer them as necessary. So without further ado, we are going to go on to when a monoblock volar locking plate is not the right choice. Now, if you think about monoblock volar locking plates, they are designed in such a way that they match the anatomy of the distal radius volarly. And they are predicated on this principle of subchondral support, which Matthew Putnam presented to us nearly 30 years ago. But the beauty of these is that if you wanted to use it effectively, you have to get distal fragment fixation. Therefore, by design, they must be placed proximal to the watershed line, and the fragment should be large enough that you can effectively get distal fragment fixation while still providing subchondral support. When Malone gave us these four fragments of the distal radius in all intraarticular fractures of the distal radius, he was very correct and on the mark. And the only thing that is different is, if these fragments are not as large and chunky, then what do you do? Then you have to adapt your thinking to Medoff and Rickley and Regazzoni's thinking of fragment-specific fixation or columnar fixation. You have to think fragments and you have to think columns. Because, the size of the fragment is what will decide what size implant you're going to use. Every time you have a distal radius fracture does not mean you use a monoblock VLP. Small fragments mean small implants. And finally, if you have an intact volar cortex proximal to the watershed line, it is highly unlikely that a volar monoblocking plate, monoblock plate will be the right choice. So what decides, what are the anatomic features that decide um, where you should use fragment fix specific fixation. Well, the first one is the radial styloid. As you can see here from the green arrow, it overhangs radially, distally, and volarly, and it is volar to the equator of the distal radius articular surface. The uh, volar lunate facet, which is shown by the red circle, overhangs volarly, distally, and ulnarly. Now the key to understanding these two fragments is that attached to each of them is a large ligament. The radius kefir capitate ligament, which was shown by Siegel and Gelberman to take its origin seven millimeters ulnar to the tip of the styloid, and the short radial lunate ligament, which attaches to the volar lunate facet. Now the interesting thing is, dorsally also there's an important fragment. This is the die punch fragment, which Max Scheck gave us in 1962. Now the beauty of each of these fragments is, they are in the close vicinity of large ligamentous attachments, which therefore means, as suggested to us by Greg Bain, that the bone right next to these fragments is much, uh, uh, has many less trabeculae, therefore making it somewhat predictably prone to de developing a fracture line. What do I mean by that? In that, the fracture line almost always predictably, reliably, and largely consistently propagates in between these ligaments. So, let me repeat that. Fracture lines will propagate reliably, consistently, and almost always predictably in between these ligaments. The only thing that is different is the size of the fragment, which will therefore decide and predicate what size implant you use. So how do I assess them? I get plain radiographs before and after close reduction. And then I get a CT so that I can study the marginal rims, the radial styloid, and specifically articular depression. 3D for me is invaluable in deciding the size of implant I'm going to use. 
So with that much said, let's turn to some cases. So as, as everything in life which is important, it all starts in Michigan. Jeffrey, could I ask you how you would approach this fracture, please? Yeah, so uh, thanks, Chai. So I'm just looking at it. So it looks like there's a, a radial styloid fragment that looks uh, rotated out of position. You can see it involving the, the scaphoid facet. Right. Now, this is a 65-year-old lady who happened to just slip on ice and fall. So it was not a high-energy fall or anything of the sort. And she was casted elsewhere and then presented with this for a second opinion. Is there anything else you would like in terms of gathering information before you decide what to do next? Yeah, I think this one, um, as, as you sort of mentioned, uh, getting 3D information would be helpful. So I think uh, a, a CAT scan would be helpful to look at the articular surface. How's that? Uh, beautiful. So looks like in addition to the radial styloid that I was pretty sure I saw, it looks like there's a, a volar ulnar fragment and a dorsal ulnar fragment. And you can see the lunate on that lateral projection on the CT, the, the, the entire carpus is shifting with it. So as you mentioned, the extrinsic ligaments are attached to that piece and, and as radiocarpal subluxation. Right. And the, to, for the audience, if you notice the volar cortex is entirely intact, right? So, uh, except, yeah, the, the radial styloid. It's, yeah, ex yeah, except for that. So if you had to approach this, do you have any um, strategic tips to share with the audience about how you would approach this? Yeah, so I think um, I, based on what you said about fragment-specific fixation, I would be thinking in terms of a, a radial column plate um, and, and a dorsal ulnar plate, I, I think would be uh, appropriate for this. Right. And when you approach these for the radial styloid, do you use a separate approach or do you go through one incision and kind of cheat over this way or that way? Yeah, uh, good question. I, I think if I was gonna be going all across the dorsal aspect of the radius and there is still a role for dorsal plating of the distal radius, um, I think you can with one approach go both radially and ulnarly. But since this very discreetly, you need to get dorsal ulnar and extreme radial, um, I would probably do two smaller separate incisions, but I think it's sort of dealer's choice. I think you could do it either way. Yeah, that, that's awesome. So we literally took your advice and I'm going to ask, uh, so this is with the first one, dorsal rim fractures with monoblock volar locking plate is not the answer, but we took uh, Jeffrey's advice and this is what we did. Hey, Chuckles, what do you think about that? Would you do that at Tuft? We lost Chuckles. No, no, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Okay. Um, that is interesting. I like it. Um, I can't really see the articular reduction uh, because it's uh, obscured by the plate and the volar, uh, the dorsal ulnar side. Yeah. Uh, I think it's buttressing it, and you got the radial styloid. Um, I think it looks it looks good. Um, the lateral is not quite a lateral. I'd like no, it's not. Yeah. A better view, but uh, I think you achieved the dorsal buttress of the of dorsal ulnar side and the styloid fixation. I, I would have, um, and Jesse taught me this, through a one dorsal incision, um, you can't elevate underneath the second compartment and get to the styloid, but you make a separate uh, incision in the uh, retinaculum uh, just at the dorsal edge of the first compartment uh, through the same dorsal skin incision, and you can get to the styloid that way. And I, I would have put a separate uh, little plate there, but this looks great. So I used a one hole plate. So by using a washer, I made that cannulated headed screw into a one hole plate. And uh, I, I, that's something that I like to do. And it does exactly what you were talking about. But uh, hey, Becky, when you have- Chai, any, just before you go on to the, the rehab, Chai, any um, upper age limit when you think about putting more of a buttress plate on that styloid? I mean, sort of as Chuck mentioned in a 65-ish year old woman, I, I might worry that your one hole plate uh, could fail given her bone and, and any thought to, to buttressing that fragment? So yes, um, if that fragment, so for me, if that fragment uh, was larger than what was available uh, and I felt that one whole plate was not adequate, then I would go with a buttress plate. But with this one, I've been using this particular technique for a reasonable amount of time and it hasn't failed me thus far. So I'm, I'm, I have no compunction. If it's clearly osteopenic bone, 
then yes, I would much rather go with a buttress plate. So, uh, Becky, can I just ask just one question yes. Uh, yes. before you move? On. So, this is a dorsal radiocarpal uh, subluxation, and the, the volar ligaments are torn. And I don't know what the right answer is, but uh, would you consider addressing the volar ligaments, or would you just uh, fix the bone and see how it goes? I fix the bone and see how it goes. Because, uh, I've, uh, you know, this is Harry. I, I've had some unfortunate, I had two questions for you, Chai. One, the use of bone graft in these cases that are yes. articular. Yes. Uh, yeah. So go ahead first. Yeah. So no, the bone graft is a very good thing. So uh, you saw in the, you saw here how much, how much short she was dorsally. So when we brought her back to length, um, there was a hiatus, which I had to fill with bone graft. So I use allograft bone chips for that. Becky, is there anything special that you would do to rehab this person when they're plated dorsally as opposed to volarly? Um, I wouldn't say as much dorsal versus volar. I think for distal radius fractures, I'd like to see her as soon as, if you feel like it's a good stable reduction and you feel like I'm able to, I'd love to start some very simple grasp and release, not isolating wrist flexion or extension, just really starting some gentle grasp and release to help get the tendons gliding and help get that natural synergistic motion moving at the wrist. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the other piece for me I really worry about in looking at these x-rays is supination and really wanting to make sure that we can start at least a little bit of rotation since that DRUJ was impacted in this fracture. So um, I would like to start it early enough to get those things started. And I think in these cases, a removable splint actually is a really good option rather than a cast because I think you can get a really good secure splint that the patient can be compliant with and have some really good home programs to help them really progress nicely. So that's uh, pretty much what we did. She was splinted for about three weeks before we started arranging her. And uh, this is her at about three months. And I've seen her since about a year. And her function is practically symmetrical on, uh, to the other side. So Yeah, that's a beautiful result. Now, is there anyone in the audience, among the faculty who would consider using arthroscopy uh, as an augmentative tool in the execution of fixation? Any arthroscopy mavens out there? Yeah, I did one recently, and it, it was a, um, a radial styloid fracture with a, a scaphalinic gap, kind of upper awesome. limits of nor normal. Yeah. It wasn't this yeah. fracture. I wouldn't have done it for this fracture. Right. But I wasn't right. sure if the scaphalinic ligament was really torn or not, and it, was actually, it worked out well because his ligament was intact, at least you know, technically intact. And I fixed the, um, the styloid just with some uh, K-wires, you know, okay. arthroscopically assisted. So you do, you do. So we'll come to that in one of the later cases, but I, I will pick on you to ask you about your role for arthroscopy in these fractures. But going on to the next case, uh, before we go on, uh, Marco and Tom, are there any questions we need to deal with? Uh, right, guess, now, right now, right now, we don't, I don't have any uh, questions. Um, <clears throat> nothing okay. that's come up from the, from the group. Uh, okay, I'll uh, throw the next one out to, hey, Jay. Yeah. So this is a 72-year-old uh, active person who is a scientist. He fell, was seen in an emergency room, and was told that he had a small fracture, and it was nothing to be worried about, and uh, sent home with a cock-up splint. How do you see that? Do you agree with that assessment? Well, I don't think it's a small fracture. I think it's a, a serious fracture. The, um, I can see how that could be interpreted that way from the ER staff or even maybe my residents will call and they'll say, hey, this, is, this looks minimally displaced or it may not be a huge issue. But one thing that I see on the lateral view that's uh, concerning to me is that that uh, teardrop angle that we think about with the volar rim, it almost looks like it's vertical when it should be at 70 degrees. And This uh, is how he came to me at six weeks. Wondering why his wrist was still painful. Yeah, and so now you can see what uh, you know that indicates is that the volar ulnar corner is not uh, not supported. It's fractured. It's already it was already displaced on the initial uh, workup films, and now you can see a step off on these uh, you know more recent films that were taken in your in your uh, you know, second round. Yeah, I, I think the the important stuff here they just said was already displaced on day one, right? Yeah. Now, if it was not displaced on day one, would any of you consider treating this non-operatively if it was completely undisplaced? Or do you see a role for internal fixation every time just because the fracture is there? I think for me, the decision 
on that is to, if it is displaced how or if it's not displaced how am I going to measure that it's really with a CT so I guess I would say that would be my my choice in that setting if I really believed it was non displaced I wouldn't trust that opinion I'd still get a CT to see what that looks like but they're so uh, classically unstable yes more often than not I still even if it's non displaced on a CT I'd still would think that it needs some type of support so at this stage would you think that you would need a CT before you plan what to do next? I think for me, it's helpful because as I'm uh, thinking about the, the implant choice, the position of the implant, uh, the, the CT information can, get, can make that, that preoperative workup and, and uh, preoperative plan a, a better experience for me. I feel more, I have more peace of mind with my plan if I've had a CT to look at the size. And then I kind of know, okay, this is the implant that I'm going to use based on what the size of that fragment was on the CT. Right. So for those of you out there, the teardrop angle that Jay was referring to refers to the inclination of the volar ulnar lip of the distal radius. And it is usually not in excess of about 65 degrees. And if it goes more than that, usually indicates a volar shear, at least of that volar uh, intermediate column or the volar ulnar corner. So here you go, Jay. How, how does this help you? Does this help you plan your surgery? What's your approach? How, how do you do it in your practice? So I, I find that this is very helpful. You can see that's a very small fragment and it's very distal. And uh, you're going to need to be able to see really well uh, on the ulnar side of the volar distal radius. And so th that approach to me is an extended carpal tunnel approach. Um, and so I think that's a very helpful approach to be facile at. That's, uh, I make mine similar to yours, although uh, you can see the carpal tunnel uh, incision between the thenar and hypothenar eminences crossing the volar wrist crease at an angle. But once I get to the uh, FCU, I usually will stay uh, parallel. That's about the only difference for me is I, I would stay parallel with the FCU uh, more proximally. I don't think this incision's uh, a bad one. I just happen to, to do it that way. But the, the key is the deeper approach. You're going to um, identify FCU, deep to FCU. You're going to identify the ulnar artery and nerve. You're going to retract uh, those safely. All the flexor tendons can then be retracted radially. Um, and then right at the base of where you'll be working is the pronator quadratus. And so you have to elevate that. You're really kind of dissecting through it. Uh, but, but once you've done that through the extended carpal tunnel release, you should be able to get a, a wide exposure of that volar ulnar corner uh, which is necessary for your implant placement. So the tip for the listening audience is that if you want to avoid cranking on the median nerve too much, you make a large bolster and place it behind the hand. So it reduces the tension and makes a retraction much easier, as Jay was saying. And oftentimes it's difficult to identify this fracture proximally. So you feel for the cortical break at the proximal ulnar edge and then develop this fracture and elevate it distally so that you can graft it, which is what we did. So do you think that's a reasonable radiographic uh, restoration, Jay? I do. I mean, even though the, your floral image is there in the lateral that you've uh, restored that uh, teardrop angle and the, um, you know, think about as we evaluate uh, like the perilunate, we think of those, uh, those radiographic lines, the C shape of the distal radius should parallel the C shape of the lunate. And right. I think that, that looks excellent. And you've got a nice, not only this uh, uh, compression screw with your, your one hole plate, but then you also have a buttress yes. uh, with a little bit actually because for that uh, anti-glide uh, effect to keep that, that uh, fragment from collapsing proximally. Right, it's a belt and suspenders kind of approach because it's a six week old injury. So I don't think I could rely entirely on that one screw. Yep. So I chose to buttress it in addition. Guy, uh, can I make a point about that? Please. So I agree completely with that. Um, that statement and the need for fixation, not in addition necessarily to your screw and a washer, which you know you you might get away with, but I would caution people in the audience to be careful not to just rely on a buttress plate like this for this notoriously unstable fracture, because you and I have both seen, especially when this is used as a truly buttress plate, as you can see, there are screws in the shaft but there are no screws in the plate fixing that volar fragment. And I've seen them jump the plate mm -hmm. and come to lie on the other side of it and then go on to this place with carpal subluxation. So either you use a fragment specific plate with at least two screws in the fragment to prevent rotation and displacement, 
or you could use a screw and a washer and maybe a smaller plate adjacent to it. But I think you have to have stable fixation of that volar fragment or else it's going to displace even with your hardware. Right. So this is him at about eight to 10 feet. One, one quick question um, uh, from, the, from the audience. Uh, uh, when you elevate your die punch fragments, do you prefer to do it open or do you just slide it freer or uh, try to go percutaneous? So uh, <laughs> when I elevate my die punch, do I do it open or closed? Correct. <laughs> yes. Um, I usually tend to do it open because um, if you can do it closed with a small incision and use a bone tamp to elevate, and that's a well-described technique, and it's elegant. Uh, but I prefer to make a very small incision, about an inch long, and which allows me to see it. And oftentimes, it's possible to get a one-hole plate, just like I showed here, through that. Or you can use K-wires. Or if you feel the need to put extra hardware, you can do that also. But yes, you can do it both ways. For, for me, it's a smaller incision makes more sense because I like to see that. Uh, so this, this was the function at about 8 to 10 weeks, I think. Now, um, given that his injury was about six weeks old, would any of you keep him locked up in a cast for a bit, bit longer than that? Or would you allow him to move early? I would prefer early motion if, the, if your fixation is stable. You're right. I, I did uh, want to move him early, but uh, I must confess, I was a little leery given his age and the fact that it was six weeks old. So I, I did keep him quiet for uh, three or four weeks and then started him. And uh, not surprisingly, he did have much less motion than the other side, but it was much better than this when I discharged him at about six or seven months, so. Yeah, just, one, just one comment. Uh, yes. um, Becky alluded to this earlier with the last case, but those fractures also involved the distal radial ulnar joint, so it's not uncommon for them to lose uh, supination. Yes. Um, and th that patient did really well. Yes. Uh, Tom, you were saying? Yes. Can I uh, bring up one point and, and one question for you? Um, yeah. I think if, if people are attempting to treat a volar ulnar fracture with a uh, monoblock volar plate, it's important to realize that most plates on the market over the volar ulnar aspect kind of pull away from the bone. Yes. And don't buttress him effectively. So it's just something to be aware of as you're choosing what kind of plates you want to use. You know, look at those little, those little components. The other thing I wanted to mention on this gentleman's original x-rays, it looked like there was separation between the scaphoid and the lunate. Yes. Um, yes. He's an, he's an older man. I just wondered what the uh, panel would think about treatment of that. Is anything necessary? If so, what would you do? So it's much more obvious here. So in this age group, I would, uh, with, with this setting, I would observe it. In a younger patient, I might make a separate dorsal approach to go down to look at it. And uh, if I found that the dorsal band was torn, I would put in an anchor and fix it. But I've, in this age group, I would observe it. Many of them might have degenerative chain uh, issues with their scaphalunate that may be pre-existing. Right, so um, I did notice that, and uh, it's like Greg Bain said, depending on the position of the wrist at the moment of impact, you either get a lunate impression, i.e. this fracture, or a scaphoid impression fracture, which we'll see later. And when I finish fixing most of these, I usually screen them uh, under live uh, fluoroscopy, and I make sure that the scaphoid and the lunate are moving as one unit. And if they're not, then I start getting worried about it only if the person is younger. But in someone like him who's into his mid-70s, I was not going to get unduly concerned by that. So, so you know, here's someone, this lady is into her mid to late 60s. Um, a few days prior to this fall, she had undergone a cystoscopy um, with a diagnosis of a malignancy and then fell and presented with a painful wrist. And uh, here she is. Kevin, what do you think about this? Are you content leaving her alone and treating her non-operatively, or should we do anything else with her? Well, and this is a uh, certainly a very common and, and uh, with a fracture with a lot of articular impaction, uh, and I, I think you have to have a sort of a long discussion with the patient, and as it relates to her, uh, you know, desires and activity level, and as it relates to her malignancy. 
Um, you know, you can see on that uh, PA image on the left that she has, you know, what appears to be long-standing ulnocarpal impaction syndrome. Uh, you know, even though she doesn't appear to be that ulnar positive, although you can get some, uh, you're not sure what her true variance is, given the fact that she's got some articular depression uh, yeah. there. Uh, but, you know, if this is a person who is, you know, has a, a, a reasonable chance at uh, recovery from her malignancy, Yes. Uh, and this is her, you know, uh, she wants to remain active. Uh, I think that uh, in leaving this fracture with the amount of articular depression uh, present uh, is going to uh, predispose her for, uh, you know, arthrosis, pain, stiffness, those type of things. Uh, a CT scan would be invaluable here just to evaluate, you know, the extent. Yeah, there you go. So pretty significantly depressed there uh, on, on the coronal and sagittal images. Uh, and, you know, with, with closed reduction maneuvers, you have no way of elevating that articular segment. There's no ligaments attached to it, so there's no ligament ataxis. Uh, and so I think that this is one that would likely do very poorly in someone who, you know, has uh, some desire to remain active uh, and, and good use of the hand. So again, uh, I think that's excellent because if you look at it, there's a, you can literally see the scaphoid causing an impression on the distal radius. And there's pred predictable patterns of fracture generation. Um, and so this, again, is a scaphoid impression fracture, which is not ideal for monoblock plating because as you saw here, the volar cortex is completely intact. So here, here we are, I spoke to her urologist and she has a good prognosis. And uh, this is a dominant hand and she really would like something done about it. So what is your strategy for something like this? Well, I'd be certainly concerned with her bone quality, given her age. Uh, I think this requires a dorsal approach. Uh, you know, the volar cortex is intact, and you really, it's not safe to visualize the volar cortex, or the volar, excuse me, not safe to visualize the articular surface through a volar approach, because you have to take down those important ligaments, uh, even though, you know, you're inclined to do so, because when you have the fracture reduced, the articular surface is uh, facing more volarly. But this is a dorsal approach. Uh, with a open capsulotomy. Uh, I like to put freer, uh, or excuse me, not freer, uh, home retractors uh, underneath the, the proximal carpal row so I can distract them uh, and, and really see the articular surface. We can elevate the articular surface then. Uh, this is gonna need some bone graft underneath it to support it. Uh, and then with her bone quality, and you know, this might be one that I might do some minimal internal fixation to you know, to support those articular reductions and then potentially even stabilize with a dorsal spanning bridge plate, uh, which will allow her to be uh, out of a cast very quickly and returning to use of uh, activities of daily living and self-care uh, very quickly uh, without a lot of undue force across that articular comminution. And then that, of course, requires a second surgery for implant removal several months later. Right. Now, the only caveat with her is she is... Uh a little obese and uh, so she just had a urinary manipulation so like you said i was a little leery about putting in a lot of hardware so i used the dorsal cortex as a track door and i elevated it that's the green arrow pointing to it and the question was what kind of bone graft to use and because of her size i was i had some concern about harvesting iliac crest mm -hmm. and i did not want to use allograft because of the urinary manipulation so i, I took chuck's advice and i used norian Comments, Chuck? Uh, <clears throat> Chai, it looks, it looks really good. Um, I think it, in, the, it, in the mode it's being used, it should be successful. I think if it's, uh, it, it works well in compression, it, it doesn't work as well in shear and certainly not in tension. But uh, I think you accomplish the restoration of the articular surface uh, and it's, uh, it's well contained. So that, yeah, that's great. Cool. And I would also leave the K wires in as you did. Right, and I wanted something inert, and I used the K-wires because I knew they'd come out. So I didn't want some hardware sitting there in case she got an infection. So uh, that, that's... Okay, so, uh, yeah, I think that's great. I, I would just make one other point. I, uh, bridge plate fixation is very popular these days, and I would say don't forget the external fixator. Uh, not everybody is comfortable with bridge plate fixation. Um, and it depends on your resources, um, but the goal of restoration of the articular surface, it could be a limited open approach. Uh, and then neutralization to protect it. And uh, you could, uh, an X-Fix would be a, a, a great way to do it as well, although it's kind of, you know, it's a lost art. So um, 
I think that those are very valid points. And uh, Becky, if you had to rehab someone like this, with her history being what it is, is there anything else that you would do, given that this nature of this injury was more of uh, an articular depression, or would you simply uh, start with a gentle range of motion? You know, I think the first thing, and I was going to say this on the last case too, is I'm going to spend some time educating this patient about how much motion she needs to actually um, complete functional activities. So there's a great article from 1991 that goes through really that 40 degrees of flexion and 40 degrees of extension are going to give your patient enough motion to be able to function pretty well. And so I'm going to try to set some really good goals with her. Um, and again, I think the functional motion in these types of cases is as important, if not more important, especially when you're worried about how much she's going to actually end up with. And so um, the other piece here that I worry a little bit about is pain um, and thinking a lot about how to help her manage pain in productive ways um, and using modalities appropriately to help with that. Great. So I'm just going to quickly go through this one. This is another scaphoid impression fracture, but much smaller depending on the position of the wrist, as Greg Bang pointed out to us. And again, the one hole played after elevation. So Chuck, this is, this is exactly what I was referring to before. This is a semi-pro hockey player who has slammed into the boards. He's uh, 19 or 20 years old, and he comes in like this. So what do we do with him? Well, I would definitely get a CT. Um, the the uh, styloid fracture ends at the scaphoid. If you could go back one for just a sec. If the, uh, the styloid fracture ends right at the scaphoid interval, so I'd be worried about the scaphoid ligament. Uh, it's not a simple fracture pattern. If you look on the lateral, uh, there's a comminution within the uh, facet and a dorsal lip fragment. Right. So here's the CT. And here's... Yeah. The so it's a, there's a marginal impaction fracture, um, which is sort of like an acetabular fracture you see on the um, sagittal views. So that you can see the arc is lost. So that's going to have to be part of the, um, the uh, reduction. Uh, this is not so straightforward as the one that I did. Uh, you could use arthroscopically assisted if you want. You're going to need to have some, some uh, to elevate it, uh, I think, graft behind that little fragment uh, if you want to do it that way uh, in fixation. And it's rotated. H.I., I have a quick question for you. Could you yes. go back to the lateral, the lateral view on the CT? It's interesting. That, is that, is my misreading, but the sort of dorsal flexion of the lunate? position there you know the lunates and like some extension there yes um you know maybe maybe it's positional i don't know yeah uh, i i didn't it was not real it was mainly positional yeah but yeah good point that's a good point so here's the rotation of the fragment and this is one of those few situations where i actually um took took chuck up on his offer of uh, doing it arthroscopically assisted and uh use one whole plate and a one an additional screw. So, anything else? Would you? Uh, I guess. You, did you did you ele elevate it? Did you make a little incision and elevate that segment, the intermediate yes. segment? Or, yes. yes. Did you graft behind it, or did you just use the you know, screw as a butt buttress? Or? Bone. So I didn't need to graft it. It stayed. So I left it. And uh, I looked at it through the scope, and it looked well restored. So as you can see, there's a bit of debris generated in the, in the screws. Just one, just a, a point to clarify for everybody. Uh, the first compartment is right there. So do you go through it, volar to it, or how do, you, how do you put those screws in? So if you look at the screws, it was one of the points I made when I was pointing out the anatomy of the styloid. You usually have to go starting volar and aim dorsally and ulnarly so that you, so that you are slightly volar to the first compartment. And uh, not surprisingly, since he's a hockey player and this was responsible for his uh, slap shot and the power that came from it, these screws did bother him. So at about six months, I took them out. Great, thanks. So this is the last one we'll do just for a couple of minutes before we hand it off to Kyle. Um, hey, Harry, what do you think about this one? As you can see, this lady, uh, this is a lady who is in her mid twenties to late twenties. She is slightly on the larger side and uh, she uh, was involved in an MBA. Yeah, so this is uh, this is a lot more significant than the other ones we had seen, obviously. And this is, I think we talked about this one, a uh, similar one previously. This is sort of a, what I look as a fracture dislocation, fracture dislocation with translocation yeah. of the, the um, distal radius. Uh, and it's, it's ominous because it, it's moving 
as, as dorsal as well as ulnar. Um, so it really becomes a high energy injury. So this is, this is, you know, assessment of the nerve injury. Often there's an ulnar nerve injury in these situations. Uh, so it's important to try to get some sensation exam, ulnar, you know, ulnar intrinsics after reduction, you know, try and get this reduced expeditiously. Absolutely. Couldn't agree with you more. And that's an important point Harry makes about this is a high energy injury. So you've got to examine the rest of the skeleton in the limb as well as other, other parts of the body to make sure there's nothing else. So this is a radiocarpal fracture dislocation. Again, monoblock VLP is not the answer. And here's the CT for you, Harry. What next? I came off a mute there. I lost the picture. Uh, so this is, you have over there the, the uh, one radial cut, and I don't see there. there there's the uh, coronal image. And you know this is this has components of all of the Malone fracture fragments in addition to the instability, right? So there's a critical volar rim uh, which has the ligament attached, short and long radial lunate, uh, the radial stelly component, and most likely a dorsal ulnar component as well. Um, and that hasn't even addressed if there was any DRJ instability, although it didn't appear to be on your original X-rays. Right. Uh, so. It's it's more than it, it it's going to need something that crosses I believe the radial carpal joint, but it's going to need more than a spanning plate or an X fix because the reduction uh, is probably going to need to occur open. So it's uh, volar probably to a certain extent volar ulnar exposure and then maybe even a combined volar and dorsal. Yes, exactly. In the interest of time, I'll, uh, uh, Harry said exactly what we did is the long extensile approach as Jay described it before, an extensile volar approach. Repaired the ligament with the suture anchors uh, on the volar lunate facet. Uh, fixed the styloid with a screw. This is many years ago when we didn't have the smaller screws available and the dorsal portion was fixed with another screw and there she is. So take home messages, fracture geometry is largely predictable, uh, consistent and reproducible, uh, reliable between the ligaments. That's where you get all your fracture lines. Small fragments require small implants. Remember that the radial styloid and volar lunate facet extend distally, and fragments which are distal to the watershed line, if, um, if they are very small, then really they are not a situation for the volar locking plate. I will leave these references on just for a second for people to get afters. And thank you. And before I hand off to uh, Kyle, Marco, do I have any questions to answer or for the panel, please? Or uh, Tom? I think we handled them, Chai. You did a great job too. Okay, so I will. Uh, I've hey, stopped. Chai, can I, can I ask a question just to provoke the discussion? Do we have a minute to talk about something here a, do. about position of post-operative immobilization? Uh, you know, with with distal radius fractures, and and, we, and Becky commented on the importance of supination getting in early. And you know, as a uh, as a fellow under Dr. Hanel, uh, you know, he really you know pounded this in on us that. You know, these patients with distal radius fractures and forearm fractures should all be immobilized, supinated uh, postoperatively for 10 to 14 days. And, you know, I've been burned, you know, as I, as I was a, a naive young attending saying, well, that's, that's overkill to put them in a long arm splint or a, a sugar tongue splint. But chasing the, the forearm contracture or instability was a big problem. So what are your thoughts on uh, position of immobilization uh, postoperatively after these cases? So I'm happy to share my thoughts with... Uh... To me, uh, if you'd asked me the same question 25 years ago, I'd have given you a different answer. But now we live in a pronated world because if you don't have pronation, you can't use a keyboard. Whereas getting change at a drive-through is much less important. So for me, if, they, if, they, if you immobilize them in supination and they lose pronation, one of the most important things that we do in our day-to-day -day life, which is using a keyboard, is lost. And no matter how much you try to use your shoulder, that degree of pronation can be a problem. So I don't worry about it too much. I immobilize them in neutral. I'd love to add to that, that it, a long arm splint or a sugar tongue splint, A, a sugar tongue splint is really hard to make effectively to really limit or keep somebody in that position. The other piece of the puzzle is I'd much rather move them early and have my fundamental concept be around motion than my fundamental concept be around immobilization. Because as soon as I'm immobilizing somebody, I'm worried about all the sequelae that'll happen after that. So I'd rather move them towards supination than immobilize them in supination. True, true. Yeah, I think uh, pro, uh, pronation problems uh, or lack of supination were very common in the X-Fix era because uh, we tended to 
pronate the distal fragment and they, they lost supination uh, because of our malreductions. And now with volar plate, I know this talk wasn't on volar plates, but with volar plates, you restore that rotation to, to normal. And they, if they lose the supination, it tends to be temporary. Okay. Um, Max, I'm done. Could we get uh, the presentation from uh, Kyle, please? Actually, we're going to start, I think, with Amit Gupta going over some of the anatomy relative to these cases. So that was great, Chai. Thank you very much. It was beautifully presented, and I think the panelists were excellent as always. Um, so we're going to move on to talking about vascularized bone grafts from the radius for carpal pathology. And I'll be talking about the 1-2 ICSRA flap, and Amit will then talk about the 4-5 ECA flap. But before we do that, Ahmed has some of his beautiful anatomy slides to share with us to go over the basic anatomic points. So Ahmed, you wanna take it from here? Thanks, Carl. Um, so I will just uh, go through this uh, few slides. So from, you, we're taking bone graft from the uh, uh, dorsal distal radius. So these are the sources that uh, has been, have been defined Zeidenberg wrote a very uh, great article about the 1-2 ICSRA, and then subsequently uh, Sheets, Bishop, and Berger from Mayo Clinic uh, defined the anatomy of uh, the vascularity of the distal radius, uh, and they talked about all these other branches. So if you look at this, it's the 1-2 ICSRA, that's a very common um, uh, source of uh, bone graft, vascularized bone graft for the scaphoid, and uh, Kyle will talk about that. Uh, there is a second EC branch and uh, you can take ICSRA and I'll show you the uh, diagram how you can uh, uh, increase the length of the uh, pedicle, but this is unreliable to a certain extent. Then there's a 2-3 ICSRA, which is uh, between the second and the third compartments, supraretinacular, that means over on top of the retinaculum. So this, uh, some people have taken this um, vessel uh, and then there's fourth EC, that means inside the compartment. And then there's a fourth EC branch of fifth ECA. So here's a diagram showing all the um, outlines. And this is a diagram from the Mayo Clinic. So this shows the radial artery here. Um, I'll take this uh, laser pointer. So here's the radial artery. And you see the one, two ICSRA coming across like this, and it goes back and joins the radial artery. It's like, a, um, and then uh, you can, the, in this course, it supplies vascularity to this portion of the radius, and you can take uh, bone on this and swing it to the scaphoid. It reaches the proximal pole of the scaphoid, doesn't really reach the waist, and it certainly will not reach the lunate. So if you want to have a longer pedicle, then you can take two, 2-3, this is 2-3 uh, ICSRA, or you can take the 4th EC. I'll show you, you can take 4th EC, you can take bone from here, and then swing it over on this pedicle because it all, they all go and, and, uh, and anastomose with the uh, dorsal carpal arch. So you can take bone from here and swing it, or you can take bone and take a longer pedicle, come across here, clip all these vessels, and then swing it on the 5th EC. So those are the things that are possible. So here's a diagram with uh, all the extensor tendons removed. This is uh, one, this is the first compartment. This is the second compartment, uh, ECRL and ECRB. This is the third compartment there uh, and uh, so on and so forth. So this is one, two ICSRA, but in the first and the second compartment and here's the radial artery. So the uh, origin goes like so and then it supplies a uh, area of bone right between the first and the second compartment, then it connects back. And then the uh, two, three ICSR is here, the fourth ECA is here, and the fifth ECA you can see here over here. So this is uh, one, two ICSRA between the first and the second. Uh, this is uh, one, two ICSRA, the first compartment the tendons have been removed, Second compartment tendons removed, and here's the one, two ICSRA originating from the radial artery. And uh, here again, in, in uh, more uh, focus, you can see the one, two ICSRA, and this is the first compartment. Um, then it, they all connect. This is two, three ICSRA, and it's mostly over the retinaculum. 
and they all connect to the dorsal carp lodge, uh, as you can see. Uh, this is a very important, um, uh, you know, uh, dissection. And as you can see, this is one, two ICSRA here. This is two, three ICSRA. And some people take uh, um, vascularized bone graft on this uh, area. Uh, pay particular attention to fourth, and you can take uh, the va uh, vascularized bone graft on the fourth and go across to the dorsal carpal large or go across the, to the fifth. So you can clip it here, take the vest, take the bone here and go across to the fifth and that'll give you a fairly long pedicle. So this is in short, uh, the summary of the vascularized bone graft. So I'll hand it over to Kyle. I'll stop sharing my slide and hand it over to Kyle. Uh, if I can. Thank you, Amit. Ma um, Max, can you run the video? All right, thanks. So uh, this is a cadaveric dissection and we're going to go over the uh, anatomy and harvesting of the 1-2 ICSRA flap. Typically, this is done with a curvilinear incision going from the dorsal aspect of the radius over the second compartment, extending obliquely across the wrist joint, and then you want to end really distal to the scaphoid and uh, at the base of the trapezium. The scissors are depicting the 1-2 pedicle, which sits directly over the retinaculum between the first and second extensor compartments. It's actually quite superficial. And one of the things that most of us like to do is to not exsanguinate these with an S-mark prior to elevating the tourniquet, just elevate the extremity, maybe a little bit of manual compression. And that will give you some blood in these vessels, similar to what you see with this injected specimen so that you don't miss those vessels because they're quite small. They can sometimes be half a millimeter or smaller. So the first step is to identify the pedicle and then you can dissect between the first and second compartments. The third compartment crosses over the second and you don't really have to deal with it if you make a limited capsulotomy. So this is identifying the defect in the scaphoid by moving over ulnar to the second compartment and doing a capsulotomy. I'll often do a much more generous dissection than this because I really want to see the scaphoid in its entirety, but you can, if you're confident, make a relatively limited capsulotomy, such as is seen in this video. So the scaphoid is exposed. You can identify the fracture fragments. I'll often put joysticks in to open it up and prepare it however I need to. And I like to do that before I finished my harvesting of the flap so that I know the size, the dimensions, and the orientation of the flap. Once you've done that, you then turn your attention back to the pedicle and the vessels, and you want to open the first compartment as is being done there, and then open the second compartment, taking care to leave a cuff of retinaculum between the compartments, sort of sandwiching that small series of perforating vessels between them. You just don't want to encroach on the vessels and you want to leave as many perforators going down into the bone. So the compartments are elevated, the tendons are retracted, and then that leaves you with a window of retinaculum between the retracted tendons with the vessels perched on top. The next step is to then harvest the bone graft. I first start with a scalpel and I make cuts rectangularly on the radial, the ulnar, and the proximal sides. You have to ligate those small vessels proximal. They continue proximally with the dorsal form vessel in the bone. And one trick is to angle your saw or your osteotome. You can do it with either away from one another so that you don't end up with a triangular graft meeting at the apex because of the convexity of the bone here. You want to make sure that you do not meet in the middle and create a triangular graft. This shows elevation of the bone graft and it's being done with uh, sort of cracking the distal bone, but I actually like to go in and make a subperiosteal incision distally and make a cut underneath the pedicle so that I can make a precise rectangular window in my cortex. 
Once you've done that, you want to elevate the bone graft. You have to be careful to elevate it with a freer elevator underneath the cancellous bone, or else it's possible to separate the cortical window from the underlying cancellous bone, and you end up just with a cortical graft. So you have to very carefully elevate as much cancellous bone as you can, and you can see that being done there with the osteotome. Once you've then elevated your graft, it's just a matter of then carefully dissecting the pedicle so that you get yourself a leash that you can rotate and give yourself enough room to reach the scaphoid. It's a little bit deceptive in the cadaver specimen because of the paucity of soft tissues, but you want to leave a generous cuff of soft tissue around the pedicle. You do not want to succumb to the temptation to visualize these vessels all the way down to their takeoff from the radial artery because you can injure them, you can de denude the pedicle of venous drainage. So leave a good cuff around the pedicle circumferentially and just trace that whole thing down to its branch point from the radial artery. The radial artery is going to be deep to the first compartment. It's going to be volar to and a little bit ulnar to it. So you've got to retract those tendons quite vigorously away in order to get to the branch point. And once you do that and you see the branch point, then you can bipolar cauterize all of the other small branches proximally and distally so that you know that you have your main pedicle. And that will allow you, as is being done here, at least some of those adventitial attachments that will otherwise hold up your graft and prevent it from rotating freely into your scaphoid. So you just carefully go through, making sure you've identified the pedicle, you can see where it's coming off the radial artery, and then you can ligate all of the other small branches and release all of the adventitial tissue until you have that graft supported just by the cuff of soft tissue, the vessels within, and the branch point from the radial artery. In order to transfer this flap, you have to carefully elevate the second and third compartment tendons, create a tunnel that you can then pass the graft beneath as is being done here. And you also have to do the same with the, the dorsal radial sensory branches of the nerve, which tend to cross this incision. So you've got to carefully elevate those and protect them and retract them and make sure you pass the graft under them so you're not sandwiching them under the pedicle. Once you've done that, you can then orient your graft uh, either horizontally or vertically, depending on your fracture. And we'll see um, how to do that in the slides I'm about to show. And then fixation is whatever fixation of choice and whatever the, your fracture mandates in terms of getting stability in this fracture. There have been cases where I've just used this as a press fit, where I carefully tailor the graft to fit exactly into the trough of the scaphoid and don't use any fixation at all. But more often I'll either use K-wires or even a very small screw in these proximal fractures for stable fixation. Thanks, uh, Max. I'm going to share my screen now. If I can. Do you see the green share screen at the bottom? I do, yeah. I'm okay. hitting it, but it's not. Um, giving me my window. Here we go. Got it. Okay, great. Let's see how that does. There we go. Can everybody see that? Yes. Yes. All right, great. So as Dr. Gupta alluded to, this was really the article that stimulated a lot of uh, our interest in these pedicled bone grafts from the dorsal radius. This was in 1995 in JHS from the Mayo Clinic. And it set the stage for all of the regional vascular grafts that were based on the dorsal vasculature of the radius. If we look at the anatomy, we can see that the, can you see my arrow here or is that not showing up? If we can you, see it. Great. If you look at the anatomy, you can see that over on the radial side here, we have the one, two vessels sitting directly over the retinaculum. And then you see the radial artery sneaking 
deep to that underneath the first compartment. So this is really where these pedicles are going to be based. The branch point is distal and right under the first compartment. Because of that, and because it's a relatively short leash, these are really from the one, two uh, pedicle, most appropriate for proximal scaphoid fractures and non-unions. They don't really reach very well distally. They certainly are a tight fit to the lunate. And in the olden days, when these first started, we relied almost exclusively on the dorsal circulation. And we used these to correct humpback deformity by rotating the graft and getting the cortex on the volar side, which is a very tight fit. It puts a lot of tension on the leash of that pedicle. And most of us now, when we're dealing with a mid fracture in the middle third of the scaphoid and humpback collapse, prefer to go to some of the volar bone grafts that are based on the volar perforators within the pronator quadratus. So for this particular flap, we're going to deal mostly with the proximal scaphoid. We can see here one of Ahmet's beautiful dissections, and this is showing really, really well that pedicle that sits directly on the retinaculum between the first compartment and the second compartment. And you can appreciate how small and tenuous these vessels are, so you really want to have some blood in them when you do the dissection so that you can identify them and protect them. The branch point is here at the radius, or at the radial artery rather, deep to the first compartment. And you can see the circle identifying that branch point. So you have to retract the first compartment away as you harvest this graft and begin to elevate the pedicle. And the rectangular uh, box here is over the perforators, which are about 1.3 to 1.5 centimeters proximal to the articular surface of the radius. And once you elevate that pedicle, it easily allows you, as you can see with the box moved here, to reach the proximal scaphoid for proximal scaphoid non-unions. So let's go to a couple of cases. This is a 35-year-old gentleman who has a proximal pole non-union that's been there for two years since his initial injury. He was casted, he didn't heal. And uh, an MRI on the right side shows that he's got significant displacement in the fracture, which he can't really fully appreciate on the radiographs. And he's clearly got some vascular changes within that proximal pole. I wouldn't call this a vascular necrosis, but it's certainly heading that way. So we would characterize this as a disvascular proximal pole. So it's really an ideal candidate for using bone graft with augmentation of the circulation. And for that reason, I elected to go to the 1-2 ICSRA bone graft. It's proximal, it's displaced, and it's disvascular. And I think this is a good combination of requirements for vascularized bone grafting. So this is preparation of the uh, graft and the defect in the scaphoid. You can make out the proximal fracture line here. The freer elevator is bringing that up. And you can see the distal scaphoid. I've created a longitudinal trough within the body of the scaphoid that will bridge that fracture. And I've evacuated most of the disvascular bone from the proximal fragment as well, leaving the cortical shell and making sure that we don't disrupt the architecture otherwise. These are the vessels here directly over the retinaculum. The incisions have been made in the first and second compartment and the tendons have been retracted. So you see the soft tissue cuff. And then the pedicle is going to continue down this way underneath this retinaculum. So you have to incise the floor of the first compartment once you get your pedicle identified and your graft uh, cuts made so that you can trace this down. And I do this subperiosteally to elevate as much soft tissue off of those vessels as I can. Here we can see that graft harvested. So I've used sagittal saws here, here, and actually here taking care not to go across the pedicle. You have to sneak under it with a scalpel here, right up against the bone, elevate the pedicle, and then you can make this distal cut. And I think you can appreciate that we've left a fair amount of soft tissue around those vessels so that we don't disrupt the venous drainage and we don't injure the arterial pedicle. And you can see some bleeding on the tissues. There's a lot of discussion about whether it's appropriate or necessary to let the tourniquet down at this point and see arterial bleeding from the graft. I typically don't do that, although I did it in the first several many years ago until I was confident that I knew the anatomy well and that I was protecting the circulation. So that's something you can consider at this point in the operation. That allows us to then transfer the graft to within the, the scaphoid. You can see that it requires a fair amount of carpentry to take that quadrilateral bone and turn it into something that will fit perfectly into the 
graft into the uh, scaphoid rather. And for that, I use small rongeurs and I just nibble away just piece by piece and it takes trial and error just getting it to fit as perfectly as possible. And this was augmented with K wires. And here's that patient after removal of the K wires. This is nine months after the, the operation. You can just barely see a little remnant of the lucency that was present, but you can see that there's good bony bridging all the way across the scaphoid and this patient's fully healed. You also see that by that time, most of the defect in the bone graft donor site has started to fill in quite nicely. This is another all too common indication, which is someone who's had a prior attempt at a proximal pole fracture um, in terms of primary fixation with a compression screw. And you can see that they kind of missed the mark here. The screw is dorsal and uh, it didn't quite make it to the distal fragment. And uh, at, initially it probably did. You can see some loosening artifact around the screws and you can also see some defect in the distal radius from the screw rubbing. So this patient is young, he's athletic. He's actually a neighbor of mine. I was highly motivated to get this to heal. And it was not something given the integrity of the rest of his wrist that I felt warranted just going to a salvage operation without one good attempt at trying to get this to heal. So I thought he'd be a good candidate for vascularized bone grafting. It's a little more complicated in terms of the approach in the scaphoid. He already had a very large screw and uh, loss of bone. So I simply evacuated the tract of the old bone, cleaned it out, got rid of the scar peel, and then went to the one, two flap. Here you can see those quadrilateral cuts. The pedicle is divided here after cauterizing it with bipolar, and the soft tissues are left attached to the dorsal cortex. Here I think you can appreciate how I've sort of worked my way under the radial surface, elevating subperiosteally to leave the pedicle intact and then made the distal cut. I make it on one side and then the other with an osteotome here, and these are made with a sagittal saw. Here you can see that elevated with, again, a generous cuff of soft tissue, being certain to leave the, bone, the, uh, the blood supply intact. And here he is after placing this again, because he had had a large screw placed down the central axis of the scapoid, I elected to use K-wires, which have subsequently been removed, and here he is healed at a year after surgery. So some points about the one, two uh, vascularized bone grafts. It's a reliable pedicle from these perforators which communicate with the radial artery. It's always there. I've not seen a patient where I went in to find the one, two vessels and couldn't. You want to avoid skeletonizing the pedicle for the reasons I talked about. It's ideal for proximal scaphoid non-unions. There are better grafts, including the one Amit's about to show, for more distal lesions or for other carpal pathology. It can be difficult to achieve screw fixation, and K-wires are a great alternative. Don't hesitate to use them, and I try to get at least three for good stability. You can use a sagittal saw or osteotomes or a combination of the two, but I try to elevate the cancellous bone carefully with an elevator or osteotome to avoid separating the cortex from the cancellous bone and ending up with a cortex-only graft. And for waste or distal unions, there are better grafts, and we're about to see one from Amit. Thanks very much. I'll turn it over to you, Amit. Questions on that? Any questions on that? Anybody have questions from the moderators? Anybody in the audience with questions? They've all gone home. <laughs> They've been asking a number of questions, I mean, and uh, we've been answering them. OK, okay great. Good. Thanks. Take it away, Amit. So Max, would you uh, please uh, run the video for me? to get some vascularized bone graft with longer pedicle to reach the lunate or waist of the scaphoid from the dorsal side. Now when you go to this, as you can see, there's a tremendous amount of vascularity here. Some people like to take um, the two, three ICSRA, that's, a, that's got a long pedicle. Uh, some people like to take the fourth EC, 
So what, what happens is when you open it up, open up the fourth compartment, I'll show you there. So you open up the fourth dorsal compartment, and this is not an ICSRA, this is an EC. That means that it's inside the extensor compartment. Here is a here's the vascularity, which is which is a fourth EC. It's got connections to the uh, dorsal. So this is a this is the fourth EC. This is the fifth EC. So this is the fourth EC, and one can take a um, nice um, chunk of bone from here and base it on the dorsal carpal arch and swing it dorsally, and this will reach the lunate. The other way to do this is to take the um, take the bone from here then dissect all this out and swing it on the fifth EC, and that will reach the lunate too. So we, this is all our dorsal connections, so we can take a bone graft. We'll buzz all this. We'll buzz this here. We'll buzz that. And since we're not taking the fifth, we'll get rid of that. And we'll come over here and take a piece of bone from here. Take this and lots of dorsal vascular connections. Take this uh, capsule, uh, also retinacular tissue, and this will reach the this will reach the lunate very nicely, uh, and it'll reach the scaphoid if we go further dissecting this out. And you can see the pedicle here. Is the pedicle? See that? So this will reach the lunate. So that's the uh, four five, and uh, you can do it two ways. You can go with the uh, fourth EC, or you can take the bone graft and then go across to the fifth EC. So uh, there are lots of ways because all the vessels are kind of interconnected there and lots of vascularity going to the dorsal carpal arch. So this gives you a longer pedicle and <clears throat> it gives you a lot more flexibility for the scaphoid to reach the uh, proximal pole or the waist or even to the distal pole of the scaphoid. And certainly for um, uh, grafting um, uh, keen box, uh, I use this uh, pedicle uh, at all times. So, that's that those are our presentations I had, I had one question from the from the audience uh can you hear me okay yeah you sure. can um so it's uh, are there any approaches to the wrist that would require more attention not to injure our bone graft options not to injure the bone graft options yeah uh, well um uh you know if you mean um if you have if you have dorsal uh, exposure for the wrist, yeah, I'm assuming that that's the crux of the question. Uh, yeah, if you have a standard dorsal exposure, you know, if you have a standard dorsal exposure and there's been previous um, surgery done to it, so in most instances the fourth EC will not be an option for you, but uh, generally one two ICSRA will still be an option, um, and uh, you just have to look at the uh, 
uh, graph, the vascularity, and see what that is. And if there's been a dorsal exposure, you can always go palmarly. Um, and in the in the scaphoid, there's a there's a and we'll talk about it in the next uh, session. There's a very good palmar vasculature, and you can uh, go from the volar side and take that vasculature based on the uh, um, palmar uh, carpal artery. Yeah. Marco, there's also uh, the uh, flap that's been described by Dean Sotrianos using dorsal bone from the radius and just using capsular vessels and, and flipping the capsule over and not going to the trouble of identifying one of these arterial pedicles. And he's had good success with that. I haven't tried it personally, but for people who have a little bit less microsurgical experience and are a little more reticent, to go down these very meticulous dissections, it can be a good option and you can get a wealth of bone graft with a good chunk of capsule that has good blood supply in it. So that's another option. Yeah, I, ha I have used it, Kyle. It is uh, really a nice, a nice uh, graft for, uh, for both scaphoid and for Keenbox. Um, and I agree, it's, it's much more forgiving for folks who, who are uh, just starting out with the use of these or don't do them that, that often. Um, I think Harry- One, one point I was, Sorry, I'm, I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead, Marco. No, no, go ahead, Kyle. And then I'll, uh, Harry wanted to, after you're done, Harry wanted to chime okay. in too, so go ahead. Uh, I, yeah, I think that, uh, I think you covered the question, the, the answer, so that's good. I'm good. One Chai, point is that- Chai, you do, Chai, sorry. Chai, you do people, one, two, three ICS, sorry, right? Yes, I used to. Uh, I have since abandoned using vascularized bone grafts, and so I'm going to be the outlier here. Uh, and I, I hate to do this, but I'm going to do it. Uh, I have stopped using vascularized bone grafts. Uh, I just published my own data about using uh, just bone graft and fixation for proximal pull non-unions. And I stand by that data. And I have not felt the need to use vascularized bone grafts probably in the last 10 years. Sorry, Kyle, uh, you were saying? I, I didn't mean oh, to. I just to, wanted I, to. I just wanted to emphasize for some of the surgeons who are in the audience who have not done these. If you're going to do your first one, if you have access to a cadaver and can do some dissections, it's invaluable to just have a lot more confidence that you know where these vessels are and how to manipulate it because they are tricky, and they can be a little bit intimidating. But you know, once you've done a few, you get really comfortable with the the pattern of circulation, and they are, I think, very useful. Chai's approach notwithstanding, they're definitely more than one way to skin a cat, and um, you know, it's what you're comfortable with, what you know, and what you think the, the case requires. So um, I'm not arguing with him because I agree there's more and more of a role for you know, really meticulous bone grafts with or without blood, blood supply. And I'm reasonably confident that the law of averages will catch up with me at some point. <laughs> And then I'll go back to my 2-3 ICSRA because I find that's a little more robust. Yeah. But until that happens, I'm going to uh, keep doing what I'm doing. So. Yeah, let me, let me just say one thing, that despite all the things that we've said about techniques of vascularized bone graft, my own feeling is that stability is the key yeah. of scaphoid fractures. And you get a good stable fixation, you can make the two bones heal even if they don't have any vas much vascularity. Stability and also evacuating necrotic bone. I think you've got to clean out the zone of injury and replace it with something to provide some structure. But I agree with you that stability is really important. So uh, I'm uh, Max, I'm gonna share my screen here. Um, so I, uh, you know, we do this, we've been doing this for nine weeks now, and I uh, continue to be humbled by how much I'm learning and how much fun I'm having. And it almost seems unfair that in five weeks we'll be done with this. But not to worry, folks. Uh, AO North America Hand Education Committee will come up with new offerings to keep you engaged, entertained, and educated for all of us. So next week, we are going to be doing a pinning of distal radius fractures with Kim Mezra and the Matholian flap with... Uh, Kyle, Amit, Michael, and uh, Paul. So um, again, much like we've been doing for the last nine weeks, I think it's important to acknowledge folks who are behind the scenes, who are making all this possible. So from the financial team, here's a shout out to Karen Richards and Mike Lewis. Uh, you'll be able to access this uh, 
recording on YouTube, the AO North America uh, hand channel. And uh, we can also, you can also see the Sage on stage. And next week, we are going to have something really different. We are going to have Susan Miklovitz, who's going to be our Sage. And Sue is a hand therapist, and she'll be interviewed by Becky. So this promises to be a really, really exciting week next week. Uh, I really am looking forward to seeing all of you next week, and thank you for coming. Good night, everybody. Stay safe. Thank you.